Greetings everybody and welcome to this episode of the RISC 4.0 video blog series where we aim to explore all matters of risk management in a modern working world that is growing increasingly complex and disruptive every day. So in today's episode we're going to explore the runaway trolley ethical dilemma. Now this has been around for centuries, it's not particularly new, but it's a, a dilemma which explores risk-based decision making, particularly when there are lives on the line. Um, now, it's something that has popped up numerous times over the last year as part of the great COVID debate, um, and even and most recently as in terms of the uh, vaccine rollout debate. So I thought it'd be just good to have a discussion around it, because I think it's something that modern day risk managers do need to be aware of and probably need to start applying in uh, some of their more complex uh, decision making. But basically, the way the dilemma goes is that um, picture you're standing on the side of a railway track and you see a runaway trolley and you can't help but notice that further down the line there are a bunch of people who are at risk for some reason or another. You also notice that you have the option of pulling a lever which could divert the trolley down another track and actually put other people at risk. Now the fundamental dilemma here is that do you pull the lever? Uh, in one case a lot of people will get injured. In another case, fewer people will get injured or put at risk. But in both cases, you have to make a morally ambiguous decision around who benefits and who loses. Now, as I said, this dilemma has been around for centuries, so it's not particularly new. But um, it seems to have escalated a little bit in recent times. And, and probably the modern version of it only really came around uh, in roughly the 60s when the, the medical profession found themselves dealing with a particularly contentious question. How does a, a doctor prioritize one life over another when they've actually fundamentally taken an oath to do no harm? Um, and this sort of seems to manifest itself in, in many situations in the medical fraternity. For example, pro-life versus pro-choice, uh, prioritizing multiple casualties at the same time, uh, prioritizing organ transplants, um, and also terminal illness and euthanasia type situations. So it's almost a daily occurrence that medical practitioners have to make these value of life decisions. And it became quite contentious because, as I said, they had taken an oath not to do any harm. But it was around about the 1960s that a, a philosopher by the name of Philip Foote actually conceptualized the modern trolley dilemma as, as a means to help medical students articulate the ethical question at hand and present potential answers uh, to it. So it started off as a, a bit of a, a conceptual hypothesis or an academic question, if you will. But over the decades since then, it's actually manifested itself in many, many real world case examples. And the one that we're probably most familiar with right now is the question around how do we program intelligent autonomous machines to make value of life decisions. So in this particular case we see a autonomous vehicle coming around the corner and in one way or another it has to make a decision whether to prioritize the infant, the elderly person or the passenger. Whose life does it put first in terms of protecting? So, you know, this may seem conceptual, but the reality is that as the world moves forward uh, and we see more and more intelligent machines and autonomous machines taking over in security services, medical practices, uh, autonomous trams, autonomous cars, all of these things, this question is going to have to be answered one way or another. So right now there is a, a major debate in academic circles and in technology circles about how we actually program intelligent autonomous machines to make value of life decisions. Now, the thing that complicates this as well is, is that as you move from region to region or from culture to culture, value of life decisions actually shift. The attitudes, the cultural perceptions actually shift. So we are going to have to program machines to have differing lenses upon which to make a judgment in different regions or under different um, you know, cultural circumstances. And, and so this is an incredibly complex and morally ambiguous uh, form of decision making that we have to program into future machines and it's not going away we have to come up with an answer for this so as I said in academic circles and in certain technology development circles this is a major debate that's raging right now and I don't believe we've landed on an answer just yet but we are going to have to but perhaps you know the trolley dilemma that we're most familiar with is the one that we have been dealing with on an almost daily basis throughout the entire COVID um, lockdown period. So as a refresher, roughly March 2020, governments were faced with a rapidly escalating COVID threat. Uh, COVID was taking off an exponential 
uh, rates, and governments had to make a decision whether to lock down or keep their countries open. Now, the dilemma at the time was, if we lock down, we're going to compromise our economy because our functional working world is actually highly dependent on borders being open, free trade, doors being open, that kind of thing. Uh, but if we don't do it, we're putting multiple millions, potentially billions of people at threat. So the COVID lockdown dilemma that governments were facing is, do we lock down to save victim, potential victims, or do we keep the economy open and potentially you know, um, save our economics, if you will? So around about that time that the lives before money debate became around, and if you're reading the papers at the time, it was everywhere. We need to put lives before money. We can't prioritize money before life. Now, for me personally, I always felt that this was a flawed way of looking at it. The debate actually was never about lives before money. What the debate actually was, was lives versus livelihoods. And I think a lot of people actually miss this. You see, the economy is not just a bucket of money that we can draw from at will. It's not a light switch you can put on and off. The economy is actually a critical ecosystem upon which roughly 7.8 billion people are dependent for their health, their security, and their financial well-being. So the argument in March 2020 wasn't lives before money. It was actually lives before livelihood, or lives versus livelihood. We knew that if we compromised the economy, there would be massive downturn impacts, uh, long-term ramifications that would impact potentially billions of people. Um, and you know, if there's any doubt about this, let's fast forward now to roughly January 2021. So every year in January, February, the World Economic Forum releases their global risk report. I've spoken about this numerous times before. Um, on your screen, you will see this most latest version of what our big macro threats uh, are. And what is actually alarming is how rapidly the global risk landscape changed in the year after we chose to lock down as our preferred control for COVID-19. So if we look at the clear and present dangers that uh, the World Economic Forum are warning about, number one at the top of the list is the infectious diseases, obviously our ability to manage COVID. But straight after that is a livelihood crisis. If we move down to prolonged stagnation of our uh, economy and markets, move down to youth disillusionment and move down to social cohesion or erosion. And that's basically uh, society's frustration and mistrust of government actually escalating. Uh, those five risks that I've just pointed out are actually brand new. They weren't there last year, and they definitely weren't there two years ago. So that is how dramatically our global risk landscape has changed after the decision to lock down was, was made. And obviously, we've locked down multiple times since then. Um, if you haven't read this report, I strongly recommend it because it, it goes very much to our future generations, to our pro uh, financial prosperity, to our children's prosperity. And one chapter in particular I would encourage you to read is chapter three, Pandemials, Youth in an Age of Lost Opportunity. So the World Economic Forum come up with this term for the this compromised generation that they're concerned about, and they're calling them pandemials. And basically what they're saying is that the kids that are currently in school are at risk of a double whammy. Something like 200 million kids around the world have lost their access to regular education. That without doubt will have long-term impacts on uh, you know, global prosperity and security. Uh, but further than that, the second whammy is that when many of these kids actually come out of school, they're gonna go into a compromised, vulnerable market where job opportunities may not be there, liquidity and debt may not be in their favor. So the World Economic Forum is highly con concerned that our decision to lock down has created long-term economic ramifications that we don't fully understand just yet, and it may compromise future generations, and that's what this pandemial chapter is, is looking at. So in roughly end of 2020, early 2021, we were highly, highly concerned about the long-term ramifications of coronavirus impacts and the chosen lockdown. And so it became very, very clear quite quickly that our number one priority for 2021 is rolling out these vaccines that have become um, available to us and trying to achieve the desired herd immunity. The challenge that we have is that in order to achieve herd immunity, roughly 70% of the global population needs to be inoculated. Now that equates to roughly 6 billion people. Right? That's a lot. That's a lot of people that are going to have to be inoculated. Now, we were faced with two choices at that time. Um, either we roll this out quickly or we ensure that the vaccines go through mandatory trial periods, uh, safety periods, if you will. Now, these safety trials are actually critical to any new drug because they help us identify what the potential risks are and side effects are. They also, more importantly, help us identify specifically who is at risk. 
So the challenge that governments now found themselves with at, uh, in early 2021 was a new trolley dilemma. Um, either we mandated that all these new vaccines go through the mandatory two to 10 year safety trials that all new drugs have to go through. But if we did that, we exposed our citizens to prolonged COVID risk, which already you know, is unacceptable. Um, but secondly, we pull the lever and we divert our attention from uh, the COVID risk and we create a whole bunch of new risks, accelerated vaccine risks. Obviously, if you roll out a new vaccine on an accelerated scale to billions of people, that's going to equate to many you know, millions, possibly millions of people being put at risk uh, if we haven't gone through the safety trial. So what was born around this time was the benefits outweigh the risk argument. And this is something that we're grappling with right now. You can see it in all the press political speeches. Uh, we are accelerating an unproven, unknown, brand new vaccine across billions of people. And the question is, is that what risk is that going to actually emerge? And we're starting to see some manifest in blood clots and various other things. Um, but the general view seems to be that it's okay to do that because the long-term benefits will outweigh the risks because of the sheer number of people that are being exposed to COVID right now and the sheer disruption that COVID has experienced right now. But in classical r modern risk management style, this is actually not an absolute answer. It's also not an absolute solution. Uh, there are exceptions to this rule, and that's what we're learning right now, and that's where some of the debate is. So let's take Australia specifically as an example. That's where I live. Australia is fortunate enough that it has one of the lowest transmission rates in the world of COVID right now. So Australia made a decision roughly two months ago to adopt an accelerated vaccine rollout program. The unfortunate reality that Australia now finds itself in is, is that this choice to proceed with an accelerated vaccine rollout has actually put them in a position where in the past few weeks, more people have actually died from vaccine related complications than from direct COVID complications. Um, and that's just a really odd, bizarre position to be in because now the debate has erupted within Australia should the accelerated vaccine rollout continue? And all our targets are being rethought, our strategies are being rethought, and we're kind of in a, in a bit of a limbo. We're not quite sure what we're gonna do here, which is creating more uncertainty, more unrest, more unhappiness. And that is the challenge that we're now facing with. A lot of these decisions that we have to make around trolley dilemmas are not easy, and they have no absolute answers. So one of the things that we're now learning is, is that the, what the trolley problem is teaching us as risk management professionals about risk-based decision-making is, is that in many cases, trolley problems tend to be wicked in nature. In other words, they have no easy resolution because the problem is always shifting. Um, on the back of that, what we're also learning is, is that many of our control decisions tend to create multiple other systemic knock-on impacts elsewhere. And this is something we've seen throughout COVID. Our decision to lock down didn't end the problem right there. All it did was create other problems or delay existing problems. So when we locked down, we didn't eliminate the virus. We didn't improve our resilience to the virus. All we did, day, did was delay our exposure to the virus um, and create other simultaneous problems like economic issues and social issues, which we now have to deal with in parallel. So one of the challenges with a wicked problem is, is that control decisions are really ever absolute. And you know, I think the final learning here is, is that in all of these trolley problems, in order for one group to benefit, another must inevitably suffer. So there's actually no right or wrong answer. There's just a personal choice. And this is also something we've been grappling with throughout the COVID experience. Every time we've made a decision about locking down or opening up or rolling out a vaccine, some people have benefited, others have not. So if we follow the World Economic Forum's uh, Global Risk Report, there's some alarming messages coming out there which seem to imply that pretty soon we are going to be faced with the mother of all trolley problem dilemmas. Um, right now, our primary focus is the prolonged coronavirus impacts. That's uh, the virus and vaccine risks and, and, of course, the global shutdown. But pretty soon, we are going to actually have to start making some decisions around a number of either emerging risks or risks that existed in the past but got shelved. And this is one of the challenges that we had during coronavirus is a lot of our global macro threats that we were already existing didn't disappear during that time. They just got put on the back burner. We are going to have to bring them to the front again because they haven't gone away. So one of the questions we're now going to have to deal with is how do we prioritize any one of these macro global threats over any other? So I hope that was enjoyable and informative. I hope I didn't scare you. If you enjoyed this one, uh, please, by all means, look out for some of our previous ex episodes and then, of course, look out for uh, some of our upcoming 
coming episodes. Um, until then, keep safe and uh, until next time.